and that is, of course, the presentation of the 2013 LCWR Outstanding Leadership Award. I direct your attention to the screens in the front of the room. This song, Mata Salvadoreña, became an anthem for the liberation movement in El Salvador. It captures poignantly the struggle of the Salvadoran people living in a land torn apart by a 12-year civil war. Its composer was Pat Farrell. Shortly after her arrival in El Salvador, Pat made her home in a war zone, living side by side with people experiencing trauma, terror, and horrific loss. It was this land and this people that significantly shaped Pat into the woman and leader she is today. Who is this woman who, though a stranger to the culture, could write so movingly of the longings, hopes, and dreams of its people? The journey of Pat's life began on the Farrell Farm in Manchester, Iowa. At the age of two, she and her family moved to Waterloo, Iowa, where her father <laughs> secured a job at the John Deere Tractor Factory. As one of six siblings, Pat grew up in a family with modest means whose lives centered around the parish and the practice of faith. In grade school, Pat was educated by the Sisters of St. Francis of Dubuque, Iowa. In those years, Pat became clear about two things. She wanted to know God, and she wanted to be happy. Among the Sisters of St. Francis, she saw a happy woman. By age 14, she knew she wanted a life with them. With the support of her parents, Pat began preparing for the sisters' aspirancy program for her high school education. Tragically, only a month before Pat was to leave home, her father died at age 48. Knowing that he had blessed her choice for religious life, Pat felt empowered to proceed with her plans. She remained close in heart to her mother, who was left to raise the family alone. A wise and affectionate person, she went about quietly doing what needed to be done with no fanfare. The memories Pat holds of her mother continue to influence Pat's choices to this day. After finishing her religious formation and her college education, Pat set out to teach. While happy in her assignments, she felt a restlessness within her to be with people who were poor. Her congregation honored her desire and sent her to a parish in San Antonio, Texas, an experience which opened a door for her to Latin America. Instantly, she fell in love with that culture and environment. She went to study in Mexico, was exposed to base communities, and became enamored with that style of church. 
Shortly after that, her congregation missioned her to join their sisters in Chile. The fit was perfect for Pat. There she became immersed in the work of critical social analysis and community organizing as she lived at one with the people. Witnessing the incredible faith and resilience of the Chileans and being exposed to the work of the great liberation theologians was both instructive and inspiring. As the country returned to democracy, Pat experienced the work of active nonviolent resistance and learned firsthand about its power to affect change. Following her years in Chile, the Sisters of St. Francis missioned Pat next to El Salvador. There she made extensive use of her training as a social worker and psychotherapist, accompanying survivors of war and natural disasters, victims of torture, exiled students, and persons whom society had written off. <clears throat> For each person, and particularly those most vulnerable and those who were outcasts, she demanded respect. This is the work she values most as she looks back at her life. According to her sisters in community, Pat was an advocate for numerous individuals, such as Jaime, who suffered from severe alcoholism and lived on the streets. Pat spent hours listening to him and counseling him, and often in the mornings, when the sisters opened their convent door, there was Jaime, asleep on the doorstep, confident that if he was near Pat, he was safe. Journalist Jean Palumbo recalls that in 2001, after two terrible earthquakes, devastated parts of El Salvador, Pat traveled to the hardest hit areas. She went to listen to people and hear their stories about their loss of loved ones, as well as the destruction of their homes and crops. In many of these conversations, something extraordinary happened. When people finished speaking about the earthquakes, almost without missing a beat, they began to talk about other traumas they suffered during the Civil War, which had ended almost 10 years earlier. As Jean notes, this says volumes about Pat. Surely those people would not have shared those painful memories with just anyone. And just as surely, when they had Pat Farrell sitting in front of them, listening so intently to them, they knew she wasn't just anyone, but rather someone who really cared and was really, really listening. The capacity to stand with other people, maintain relationships, affirm and bring out the best in others, are skills that have shaped Pat into the leader she is. She calls her own style of leadership courageous accompaniment. She says, I think part of what I bring to leadership is a willingness to go into situations that may appear daunting with a certain abandon. I can jump in with both feet without requiring a road map and have a willingness to make my way. She is an initiator who often sees a third way or a different perspective that can reframe a situation. One of Pat's most outstanding leadership skills that she brought to her service in the LCWR presidency is the capacity to respond to outward situations with deep inner reflectiveness. Pat's friend, sister of St. Francis Dorothy Schwenninger, notes, Pat's more than 30 years of practicing resurrection and hope with those who knew daily trauma, oppression, exclusion, and injustice readied her to stand in the role of leadership as LCWR 
face the challenges unfolding within the church today. Pat and the leaders of LCWR present it to the whole church and the world community, a model of integrity, nonviolence, and resolve. Never one to seek the limelight, Pat met the media storm, as well as the outpouring of support from the laity with extraordinary poise and a faith-filled serenity. She demonstrated unflinching values and a non-anxious presence as she spoke of the fidelity of U.S. women religious to gospel values. Pat credits the spirit for that non-anxious presence. She says, the real exercise of leadership is that willingness to stand in some risky places and to have the vulnerability to give voice to genuine responses with words that are both truthful and nonviolent. And it involves trusting, as I have experienced, that the graces come precisely when we need them. Clearly, the capacity to live at one with God's Spirit comes from having given up ourselves so fully to the pursuit of knowing God. The stream of deep quiet that runs through her springs from a great fidelity to prayer. Pat says, I have always had a real need for solitude and prayer. I also have been exposed to the simple faith of simple people, beginning in my own family home and in the settings in poor areas where I've worked. She holds as a role model Dom Helda Camera, who chose to live during his years as a bishop in a poor neighborhood with constant noise and little space or privacy. Yet, while totally immersed in the real life of the people, he was able to live reflectively, bringing both his inner and outer worlds together. This too has been a lifetime practice of Pat's. No matter where she is or where life has taken her, she disciplines herself to schedule blocks of time solely for solitude and reflection, she says, it is not that I come out of times of quiet with answers or visions or brilliant ideas, but I think that nourishing that space creates an openness to perceiving visions and ideas when they do come. She is convinced that the practice of leadership today demands fidelity to contemplative time. Sister of Charity Peggy O'Neill, who lived with Pat in El Salvador, says, During the many years, I watched how Pat drew strength from entering into her deepest self each morning, probing the scriptures or poetry, or just being perfectly quiet and open to the movement of the God of life. She knew how to direct her attention to the mystery we were living in, the greater mystery, holding it all together. And so tonight, Pat, we, your sisters, celebrate your life, steeped as it is in that greater mystery. We applaud your efforts to restore human rights in Chile and accompany returning refugees through minefields in El Salvador. We pay tribute to your spirit that is so rooted in the gospel and grounded in a preferential option for those who are poor that it is compelled to sing songs that cry for liberation and equality for all. We thank you for a leadership steeped in contemplative deliberation. That approach believes that respectful dialogue will eventually demonstrate our fundamental oneness, and along with our deep faith, 
will allow us to find fresh ways forward. And so, in gratitude for the bountiful generosity with which you have served this conference, the body of women religious globally, and the wider church and world, we honor you, Pat, with the 2013 LCWR Outstanding Leadership Award. And so it is with tremendous pride, Pat, enormous respect, and the deepest, deepest of gratitude that we recognize that there have been other presidents who served during very, very tumultuous times. What we are saying to you tonight, though, is thank you for being the public face and the public voice that you were for us which challenged each of us to be that same public face and public voice that you were. And so, it is our privilege to present to you the LCWR Leadership Conference of Women Religious proudly presents this 2013 Outstanding Leadership Award to Pat Farrell, missioner, advocate, witness to gospel values, leader, companera, hermana, sister, friend, with deep love and gratitude from your sisters of LCWR, Orlando, Florida, August 16th, 2013. I can't imagine what it is to see your life on a screen like that. It's, it's overwhelming. So I thank you so much. Um, and I have to say it's really a particular honor to be um, recognized by one's peers. So I thank you for this overwhelming affirmation. And also I want to thank each of you for your support during the entire time of my LCWR service. Uh, I would have to say that your trust has sustained all of us in LCWR leadership, and we are all very appreciative. It has truly been an experience of grace and of being carried by all of you and by God's Spirit. I am very aware that it's unusual for someone just leaving the presidency of LCWR to be given this outstanding leadership 
Award, and I really want to receive it in the name of all other LCWR leaders who have managed crises and conflicts and controversies. One of the things that I've learned in these years in LCWR leadership, that that really has been a continuous reality for LCWR over the years, really. And sometimes, sometimes the difficulties have been more behind the scenes, and other times they've been very public. But each LCWR leadership time has had some minefield to maneuver. And as you saw, I, know, I do know about minefields. <laughs> and we have all done that. We've all done that maneuvering in ways that are truthful and conscientious, sincere and soul-searching. So as you honor me tonight, please join me in also honoring our 50 plus years of LCWR outstanding leadership. And I would just like to ask that all former presidents who are here, please stand and be recognized with me, all former executive directors and all board members. These are the women who have been maneuvering those minefields for many, many years. Now, as you know, in my own experience in LCWR, I have found myself publicly thrust into what is the crucible of our time, the reality of polarization, division, and mistrust. And actually, all of us together have been placed squarely in the middle of the polarization in our church. It's very clear to me that what we are learning is not just for ourselves. The world around us is also searching for a way through very polarized landscapes. It's not at all easy. In my own searching, I've come to a few insights and conclusions. I've learned, for one thing, that it really usually doesn't work to try to convince one another of different ideas or positions. Often we come from such different experiences or world views that just hearing the thinking of another doesn't change our own. And of course, suggesting that someone else's thinking is wrong is even less effective. <laughs> but then, divergent thinking is not the problem. As Margaret Wheatley has said, it's not our differences that divide us. It's our judgment of one another. And where there is judgment, there's no safe environment in which to really see and hear each other. So I find myself asking over and over again, what conditions are needed to create an environment that does feel safe for honest, courageous conversation? We all know that what doesn't help is condemnation, power differentials, intimidation, that's pretty obvious. But it's also the assumptions and the biases that we all have that are even harder to lay aside because we're usually so blind to them. So what does help? I recently heard a talk in Iowa by Parker Palmer in which he described how one group did that. People with highly charged, opposing views on something came together for a day of conversation. And the only rule for the day was that no one was allowed to express his or her position until the very end of the day. They could only tell one another stories 
about the experiences in their lives that led them to believe what they believe. The storytelling, I think, forced people to walk around in one another's experiences and feelings. Doesn't that sound like a contemplative exercise, like gazing, like a long, loving look at someone else's reality? It's the quality of our presence and our transparency to one another that does help to bridge the gaps. But that kind of presence is a capacity, an ability, a skill to be cultivated. It's also a grace, an inner spaciousness that comes not from our own effort or striving, but from God at work in us. A friend who's been to Africa told me that there are parts of Africa in which people greet one another with the expression, I see you. And the response is, I see you too. Isn't there just something simple and lovely about that? I think another way through polarization is to really see another person and to really allow ourselves to be seen. To really see someone else as that person is requires the simple gift of attention, and that in itself is an affirmation. To allow, to allow ourselves to be seen is equally as challenging. Expressing what we think and feel, really, with transparency and vulnerability is for the brave of heart. I think, though, it is what we're being asked to do in our current conflict. All of a sudden, the world is looking to us. And I think in response, what we've been doing is to continue to call ourselves and one another to truthfulness and integrity and to a thoughtful sorting out of what that means concretely. I believe we are being invited to give, to give voice to the perspective that comes from our years of mystical and prophetic living. It's not the only perspective, but it is ours. And it is the gift that we bring to the church and the world. We can only walk by the light that we've been given, trying to articulate what our experience has allowed us to see. The apocryphal Gospel of St. Thomas says, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, it will destroy you. LCWR has been a forum of peers that has helped me to bring forth what is within me. We have talked together. We have shared leadership. And that has made all the difference. I'd like to share with you in conclusion, Mary Oliver's poem, The Song of the Builders, used at our last board meeting as a send-off for those of us completing our leadership. It says this. On a summer morning, I sat down on a hillside to think about God, a worthy pastime. Near me, I saw a single cricket. It was moving the grains of the hillside this way and that way. How great was its energy. How humble its effort. 
Let us hope it will always be like that, each of us going on in our inexplicable ways, building the universe. Thank you for this honor, and thank you for the opportunity to serve you. So we are happy to...